Today we learned the basics of the practice channel, from the parts it has, to how to keep it clean, to how to put your fingers on it. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident piper. If you like this kind of content, please think about liking the video, subscribing below. Also, I do give Skype lessons if you want more personalized instruction, but more on that later. There's links below to PDFs of a description on how you can put your fingers on it using the same method I talk about in this video. Print those out, have them ready so you can follow along. So, someone's given you a practice channer, or maybe you picked one up on your own, and you're ready to start this journey. What do you do with this thing? What are all the parts of it? How do you make it work? How do you keep it clean? And more importantly, how do you even put your fingers on it to get it to start making noise? Well, that's what this video is all about today. So the parts of your practice channer. You should have a bottom, you should have a top, and you should have a reed. This is an old 2001 McClellan practice channer, but they're all basically the same. You have the bottom where your fingers are going to go, the top that you're going to blow into, and the reed itself. In working with the reed, I tend to use three fingers and I try to hold it so that the blades, and I have a bit of a dental elastic on here to ease this abbot in just a bit. So I like to grab it with three fingers on the wrapping. So you can see here, I'm not touching the blades at all. I'm grabbing the wrapping. And with three fingers, I'm much less likely to crush the staple, which is the metal tube, get that string out of the way, which is the metal tube that the reed is built around. Now, they're pretty hardy, but if you grab it super hard, you might actually be able to crush it just a little bit. Using three fingers puts a more even pressure. I like it. So we're going to seat it in the top of the practice channel. So when I seat it, I put it in, give it a bit of a twist, and I would do this maybe over a pillow to test it if I were you, but I like to make sure that the reed's in strongly enough that it's not gonna fall out. We wanna make sure that we have a nice airtight seal right here and that none of the air is escaping down into that. And if it's in there firmly enough that you can hold the channer up by the reed, you know it's doing well. But if you have a wooden channer, I wouldn't recommend this unless you have a pillow or something else to you know, have it fall on. I don't wanna have anyone breaking their channers and blaming me. In putting the top on, we wanna make sure that we're not like turning the corner around the reed. You wanna take the top, and I like to have my hand around the bulb, which is this part right here at the top right underneath the tenon, which is where the string or O-rings are, depending on your model of chanter, I like to have my hand right on the bulb and right at the ferrule or the base of the top. If it's a plastic chanter, it might not have a ferrule. If it's an older wooden chanter, it probably does. The ferrule is the metal ring here. But in any case, at the bottom of the top section, we're gonna grab that, we're gonna grab this, and I like to just kind of drive it carefully right into the top doing my best to make sure that the reed is not hitting the sides of the top. You wanna to make sure that when you put the top on, you're not doing anything to damage that reed. So now we have the chanter assembled. How are we gonna put our fingers on it? So today I'm going to be using an actual uh, Shepherd Blackwood pipe chanter that I happen to have a practice chanter top that'll fit so it looks the part. And I have filled it with pipe cleaners so that you can see where all the holes are because I think that might help make it a little bit easier. To start with, we're gonna be positioning the bottom hand on the practice channer. And you can see here, I have marked with a Sharpie the part of your finger that, at least for my hand, is gonna be covering. For the pointer, middle, and ring, you can see it's somewhere in the middle of the middle pad. And for the pinky, it's on the nice fleshy bit of the last pad, but not the tip. We're gonna be using the flats of our fingers to put our hands on the practice channer. For the top hand, for now, I just want you to grab the practice channer by its top and kind of get it out of the way as we position the bottom hand on the channer. And the first thing I want you to do is kind of just shake your hand out and let it kind of naturally fall to your side. I'll go ahead and raise that. You can see I have just a nice kind of natural curve to my hand. It's not completely straight, but it's not super loose either. This is a nice natural position. And when we go to move our fingers, the motion is gonna be from this knuckle. It's not gonna be this kind of motion. We're gonna be using the flats of our fingers. To position the bottom hand on the channer, we're going to start with our pinky. And I'm going to put, and again, I have it marked. It's the nice fleshy bit on the pad of your pinky and over the bottom hole. Then we're gonna go up one, two, three holes, and we're going to put the middle of our pointer finger over that hole. So you can see here, you have two holes left, and you can see how much finger is dangling over the channer. From here, 
I just want to naturally let the other two fingers fall over their holes. So everything's nice and natural. We're not trying to curl these up. We're not trying to keep them overly straight. So last pad, middle pad, these should naturally fall right on their middle pad. You can see where the marks are on my fingers and they correspond with the holes. The thumb should be directly behind the middle finger as if the hole was drilled all the way through and you're trying to cover it with your thumb. We don't want it up here. We don't want it down here, right here. There's going to be some note changes where we're actually going to be pivoting our hand to some degree and the point you want to be pivoting on is right there from under your middle finger. So that is the proper bottom hand position for the Highland Pipes. For me, it's the right hand. For most people, it's gonna be the right hand, but if it's your left hand, then it's your left hand if you have some reason that you would prefer to be learning. The top hand controls what side the bag is gonna be under for most players. I've seen a few players that actually have their hands switched and the bag, the, the bottom hand is controlling the bag. I'm not quite sure how they strike in, but uh, it seems to work for them, but that's obviously not a traditional way to play. The traditional way we learn and uh, play the pipes is under the left arm with the left hand being on top. So we have the bottom hand in the correct position. Now we're going to go ahead and position the top hand. So the top hand, the pinky is not going to be getting used. And because of that, we don't have to have it over so far. The reason for this kind of crazy bottom hand position that has so much finger dangling over is because the pinky has to cover a hole. If not, we'd probably have it over here because the further out you are on your fingers, the less motion it takes from your knuckles to have your fingers lift off the hole the same amount. So on the top hand, we don't have to worry. Now again, I have my fingers marked where I'm gonna be covering the holes. Thumb and these three fingers. And notice they're all on the pads of the fingers. On this one, I go ahead and put my ring finger down first, then my middle finger, then my pointer finger, and then my thumb. And now notice my hand is coming in kind of perpendicular to the channer. And the thumb is, let's turn this all the way around, the thumb is at a 90 degree angle, more or less, to the channer, and about a 45 degree angle this direction to the channer. So we turn this around that way. See about 45 degree angle. Nice natural curve on this hand as well. Now one of the big things that people wonder about is what do I do with this pinky? And the answer is, it depends. So when it comes to the pinky, I recommend having it float if at all possible. That's how I was taught. And coming from other instruments like the saxophone, having a the whole pinky table where you have to control, having it in the air just feels natural for me. But that said, I have taught students that by having the pinky up, it ends up giving them a pretty loose E grace note. We want a nice chirpy E grace note when we get there. I know, I'm getting ahead of myself. But we want to be able to move that ring finger quite quickly. And for some students, I have found that having it tucked underneath gives them a far more snappy and crisp E grace note. For me, if it's tucked underneath, that finger tends to move more slowly and it doesn't really work. So I have mine floating. Where should your pinky go? For now, as a beginner, wherever it's comfortable. But when we get to E grace notes in particular, I want you to kind of evaluate and we'll have a video on E grace notes eventually and there'll be a link to it when we're ready. But I want you to evaluate how your E grace notes are sounding with your pinky up or down and you can kind of make the call there about what's gonna work best for you. When it comes to putting the channer in your mouth to start actually making music with this, we want to make sure that it's centered in our mouth. We don't want it off to one of the sides if we can help it, especially if you're a beginner. You want to try to develop all of the muscles in your face to make a good solid seal on the mouthpiece of your chanter. We also want to do our best to try to keep our cheeks firm. You want to kind of think about pulling the corners of your mouth back a little bit and keeping your cheeks nice and taut so that we don't have our cheeks puff out. <laughs> It's not the worst thing in the world, and there's plenty of great pipers that actually puff their cheeks out. It doesn't really affect your tone, but your face will slightly start stretching over time and jowls and all of that, and we don't want that. Try to keep your face tight. For the position of where the mouthpiece should go in your mouth, I have it resting on my top teeth and slightly behind. So 
My teeth actually are resting on this, but my bottom teeth are not. I actually curl my lips slightly over my teeth and use the muscles of my lower lip to press my lip into the mouthpiece. That keeps me from chewing on this thing. This mouthpiece right here is 17, 18 years old now, and yeah, there's a little few minor, minor scratch marks, but there's no big teeth marks, and it's the original that came with this from 2001, and I play this thing every day just about. So uh, it's held up great. So if you don't have both your teeth resting on it, you're not gonna be able to chew on it. And I don't have a mouthpiece protector or anything on here and it's still doing fine. The reason I like it being slightly behind my teeth is if someone were to bump into it, if it was in front of your teeth, it could like really hurt, might even knock a tooth out. If it's behind your teeth and it gets knocked, it might hit you in the roof of the mouth and boy howdy, that might not feel good, but you're not gonna lose a tooth over it. Now that we've gone over how to put your fingers on the practice channel and we've talked about how to properly place your mouth on the mouthpiece of the top, we're ready to try to make some noise out of this guy. If the holes are all properly covered, using the method that we already discussed, you should get a nice deep tone. And that low sound is what we're looking for. We don't want to hear something like all of that kind of fuzzy, funny business, that tends to mean something is not covered. And the higher pitch the sound that's coming out, the further up the chanter the finger is probably not covering. So again, we're listening for nice deep sound. If you hear it's this finger right here that's leaking. It's a pretty high sound. If you hear and it's a lower kind of fuzzy sound, it's probably lower on the channel, closer to the low G. So start developing your ear to hear if the sound is higher or lower, it's gonna come in very handy. Also be aware, you're not gonna really feel the holes under your fingers. The nature of where we're covering on the practice channel, it's weird. And there's not a ton of nerve endings in the middle of your fingers. Over time, they will develop and you're gonna feel them just fine. But for now, when you're just starting, it's kind of more um, trust that they're covering than actually feeling the holes. So when you can get a good, solid low G out of your channer, you're ready to move on to the rest of the scale, which is covered in another video. At the end of a practice session, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to dry this out. There's gonna be a lot of moisture building around the base of the reed and throughout the whole top. One of the things I like to do, have a couple of paper towels ready and dry out my mouth as best I can, swallow any saliva I might have, and onto a paper towel or a cloth that you can wash or something, not, like, not your leg and not your instructor's floor either. You know who you are, people. I like to blow through the bottom end of the top section and that helps force much of the liquid and saliva out of it. If you have a brush, you can brush it out. If it's a fully plastic top, you can even rinse it under some water. You wanna keep it clean. Then for the reed, I want to take it out. Again, I'm gonna use three fingers, wrap my hand kind of around it, and take it out and then let it dry. I'll often do the same thing if I see standing water on the reed, dry my mouth out and again onto a cloth or a paper towel or something, blow through it backwards and you'll see probably an awful lot of moisture will come out of the reed when you blow through it that direction. As for the bottom itself, I like to look through it and see, like just point it at like a light or something and see if you see standing moisture in there. A lot of times the top and the reed will kind of tackle most of the moisture, but if you see standing moisture in here, pipe cleaners, just that you can get it like a Michaels or whatever, um, run it maybe halfway down and back out. You don't want to get stuck in there. Uh, and then maybe halfway down and back out the other way. You're not necessarily trying to get it bone dry, but you want any larger water droplets that are in there to be broken up into more of a film that uh, evaporates quickly. Then I like to find a safe place where I can keep these disassembled. So maybe on a cloth um, that's on a shelf, that's away from cats and pets and things like that, or children or whatever. Uh, it might need to be in a drawer. Um, just make sure it's not an actual airtight drawer. You wanna get some airflow into it. But I like to leave it disassembled uh, someplace safe that it can air out. And so I'm doing my best to not have it grow anything. Now, RG Hardy has these new twist trap tops and they're pretty cool. The idea on these, if you have one of these, is that the ferrule, which you can see right there, actually unscrews from the top. And you can tell if you have a twist trap, it says it, they're, they're well branded as they should be. It's a great idea. You can unscrew the ferrule and the water spit is all going to be on here. You can still blow through this. You can rinse all of this off. It's plastic. It's great. 
um, and you're going to find that this is going to stop much of the moisture from even getting to the reed to begin with. So fantastic design. That's how you deal with it. I would again rinse these out, at least dry them off somehow, and then let them dry separate before I put them back together before my next practice session. And again, it just screws together and you're ready to go. There are other practice chanter tops that have other moisture control designs. I don't have any present with me. If you have one of those tops and want to kind of describe how it works, please in the comments below, write in how you go about cleaning and maintaining whatever moisture control you might have in your top. If you find that it's just particularly wet and that you're getting a lot of moisture coming out of your channer at all times, you might want to think about either purchasing um, some small absorbent sponges that uh, a lot of bagpipe retailers have, or even just buying like a cheapy kitchen sponge and cutting it into like small strips that you can like wrap around the bottom. They'll expand as they get wet and they can go a long way to keeping you from having a waterlogged channer. Now that said, the most important thing you can do is before you go to play, swallow as best you can. You want a relatively dry mouth. Now, much of what's building up in here is condensation from the warmth of your breath and the fact that it's coming out of your lungs at basically 100% humidity. You don't want to be adding to it with a bunch of slobber. Also, have a clean mouth. I try to at least rinse my mouth out thoroughly with some water. If I've eaten something recently, I'm going to want to brush my teeth. I don't want bits of sandwich or, you know, haggis or whatever might uh, have been for lunch on my reed. It's going to be getting kind of gross anyways. We don't need to like help it out. All right, everybody, that's the basics on the practice channel, how to assemble it, how to maintain it, how to put your fingers on it. I've already made the next video, which is how we go about learning the basic notes of the scale. That'll be linked in a card above. So move on to that once you have your basic understanding of how to get a good solid low G on your practice channel, and you'll be ready to start learning the scale of the Highland Pipes. Thank you for watching, everybody. If you got something out of this video, go ahead, give it a like if you can, subscribe to the channel, Comment below with your thoughts and share with any pipers that might need a little assistance on how to get their fingers wrapped around a practice channel. If you want to go the extra mile, go ahead and head over to my Patreon, where as little as a buck a month can go a long way to help support the channel. I have some exclusive content there, as well as some advanced viewings of upcoming videos, so go ahead, check that out. I do give Skype lessons for those wanting more personalized instruction. Go ahead and head over to www.mattpiper.com or email me at the address right there, and uh, we can get you going. Thank you so much, everybody. Again, I'm Matt Willis, Bagpiper, and until next time, cheers. <laughs>